Okay, so let's talk about PowerMax management. Again, this may be a point we make a break. So I'm Vince Weston, technical evangelist for Dell EMC, storage field day 16, here to talk about management of PowerMax arrays. So thank you all for your time. Let's get started. In terms of general management architecture, um, we have a GUI, we have a CLI, we have the underlying APIs that allow all this stuff to work, uh, and then we have a, a big REST API collection that allows us to connect to just about anything. So you've got um, provisioning, uh, replication, migration, system information, performance, all available through whatever kind of tools you want. Um, and that all ties into uh, the overall array. We'll talk through some of those details over the next couple of slides. Um, for example, with VMware, we have very deep integration, as you might expect. Again, gee, we've got a few friends at VMware. Uh, so uh, we have API integration for VAI and VASA. We've got VVOL support. We've got VSI storage integration. We've got Unisphere ability to see what's going on so you can look at the VMs that are on an ESX server um, and understand the LUN relationships and understand how all that stuff works. Um, we've got, and with VSI, you get the same thing from vCenter, right? We've got the storage analytics um, ties into um, vRealize Ops. Um, we've got the PowerMax uh, orchestration um, with vRealize Orchestrator. We've got uh, RDA, R SRA for SRM for SRDF, because again, we've been doing this with VMware for quite a while. Um, login site, whatever you need, we tie into a whole bunch of things here with VMware. So uh, good friends at VMware, lots of good stuff to do. Glad to help you support your VMware environment. Uh, REST APIs, we've got all kinds of things. So this is a collection of resources. I expect you all may want to click on slides and go find some links. Um, you can start really simple with something like the GitHub repository. Um, which is a uh, Python going into uh, Unisphere for VMAX to get sample code and all that stuff. So that's easy to find. Uh, there's also a whole bunch of things in the community.emc.com um, where you can go things about all the REST API pieces and that kind of stuff. So lots of things about that. If you need any more help, feel free to send me an email. I can get you in touch with all the management team. We can help you find all the depth. We've got you know, sample things, uh, sample code. We've got folks who can walk you through you know, using some of our little snippet uh, devices that can work with this. I'm um, glad to help you getting up and running, doing any of that that you want. Um, drilling into like the GitHub pieces, right? we've got things that multiple pieces, multiple people have posted about how to use you know, Ansible or whatever other particular thing they were interested in, but how to tie this in with Alexa. Right? Whatever you want to do, you can tie it in with the REST API and go. Right? So it all depends on how creative you want to get and what you want to do with it, um, how you want to play with GitHub. We're glad to support that. Um, we can also do some interesting things with, uh, the, again, the Python code. So you take all this and you link it um, through the REST API scripts, and it comes down to specific calls. And if you really want to do the let's get geeky about Python, we can talk at the level of you know, how do you name your functions and set up the calls and do some of those things. I'm assuming at this point in the afternoon, none of you really want to talk through each of the individual pieces. Um, but we've, again, we've got samples like this, some very definite no's. Um, we've got lots of samples like this. We're glad to help you uh, work through any of that. If you or any of the folks you're dealing with you know, want help to go play with this, um, we're glad to help you do it. Um, we just wanted to, to put this up as an example, right, to give you a sense of how it's going to work, because we didn't figure you'd want to go through it line by line. All right, uh, Cloud IQ support. Again, Susan's in the back. She's going to talk to you about Cloud IQ in a few minutes. Uh, so we have the ability, um, doing the early access program, to start tying this in for our arrays now. Um, and again, you'll see that full support coming in like September. Uh, so you'll, you have the code now on the PowerMax arrays, and we can do it on VMAX All Flash. We're planning on taking that all the way back to the early VMAXs. Um, so we'll have you know, 76 code, 77 code, 78 code, uh, and potentially, um, I guess 76 code is as early as we're going. Um, so that'll give you all that. So. Great options to, to see this, and then we get a chance to roll up data, and so you'll get a chance to see this for your PowerMaxes, but you can already see it, already see it for Unity. Um, you've got uh, Extreme I.O. coming and other things, and again, I'll, I'll stop talking about that and let, let Susan talk more about Cloud IQ because it's pretty awesome. All right, so what have we done with Unisphere for the GUI management? Um, Power, Unisphere for PowerMax uh, version 9 uh, is the latest and greatest version. It has been completely rewritten. Um, so that it is now all HTML5 based. Um, so we have 
the ability to do things much faster, um, much more flexibly. We support all the new role-based access control options. We've got the service level information. We've got the um, non-disruptive migration support changes all in here. Um, all the kinds of things you'd want to do for managing all this. Um, and again, support for Emacs 1, 2, 3, all flash, right? All of this being brought forward with the management tools, um, all with this simple HTML5 interface. So before I pick up the interface, any questions? So I'm actually going to slide up to this thing and type on a keyboard for a minute. Uh, this is a demo edition, so it is connected to exactly nothing in terms of real-world hardware. Um, but it has some sample data built into it, which allows me to do consistent demos. Right, so there are going to be some things we'll get into, and they'll say, you might say, how do you do that? And it's like, well, if I had a real system, right, if I were a real boy, I'd be able to do that. But yeah, today I'm not a real boy. Um, so at the home level, you can see your multiple arrays. Um, hopefully, you know, you're a good customer. You've got 20 or 30 arrays sitting in your data center, and you're buying more, <laughs> and that's a great thing. Um, we want to make it easier for you to find them all and to be able to quickly understand you know, how many storage groups you have, how healthy are they, is your array in compliance, what's your you know, health score like, what's your throughput like, you know, just a high-level view. Which array should I pay attention to? What's going on? Um, I can take a look at... For example, this particular array, and it says, gee, I'm in this array. I've got a certain amount of capacity. So in this case, I have subscribed uh, uh, 114 terabytes of data, and I've written to 44% of that. Right? So I've written 50 terabytes or so on the front end. Um, in this case, of that, because I've got several snaps and things going on, I've consumed almost the same in usable capacity. So I'm getting kind of high on that. Um, my oversubscription is about 186%. Um, my overall efficiency is about 3.2 to 1. And I can look at things like capacity trends where I can see you know, my usable is sitting flat. I'm not adding capacity, but I keep adding LUNs. Right? I'm subscribing more and more. At some point, I will run out of space. And I can look at some historical performance, and I can change. Again, you see easy buttons here for four-hour performance, one day, two week, you know, quick overviews of what's going on in the box. If I'm worried about health, I come over here and I click on system health, and it would show me the scores and the individual pieces. And then if I wanted to drill into like storage groups, if I had a service level compliance issue, right, I might just say, hey, show me my individual storage groups. What's going on with that? Right? And I can jump right into the storage group level and go look at individual storage groups. I might say, gee, you know, what's going on with this particular storage group? And it'll give me lots of details about it. Um, and then I can go in and and change things, set host I.O. limits, change the protection, right, do whatever else I need to do to, to bring things into compliance or to change other things. Um, in fact, while we're here, let's go ahead and do a demonstration on protection. So I can take this guy and I can say, gee, I want to turn on TimeFinder for this. So yep, let's go turn on some local snaps. I want to build a new group. Let's see, I'm going to call this BizVince1, <coughs> names of the snaps. Um, we're going to do a time to live expiration. We're going to make these guys die after 12 hours, right? So it's just going to create snaps and they're going to live for 12 hours, right? Now, by default, it'll make one of them right now, um, or I can set a schedule and I can say, yeah, no, I really want to recur. I want these to recur. I want to start them today. Um, I want them to start at, um, eh, I can't start them in the past. Let's start them in the future. Start them at 5 o'clock. Um, and I'll let it go 5 o'clock, top of the hour, every one hour. So what this will do is this will create snaps every hour on the hour, and it'll keep them for 12 hours. And so I've got this nice set of background snaps. OK, that's what I want for my schedule. I can look at this and see the summary of what I'm doing. Right, Expires after 12 hours, not being done on both sides of RDF. Um, I want them to go every hour um, starting this afternoon at 5. Yep, go. Right, Add that to the job list. It'll get processed. And then I can go back to doing whatever I want to, and I can look in the job list, and I can see when it's done. And lo and behold, now I've got snaps going every hour for that. That's how much work it takes to build snaps. Right? Not really difficult. Um, and if you wanted to, you could set the, the, uh, the secure snap flag on there as well. Right? That's in the advanced settings and done. So what's the warning on the first storage group there from a compliance perspective? Um, he's saying he's marginal. He's got a response time challenge. Again, this is a sample data set. So okay. when someone was playing with a sample data set, they played with it the wrong way, and it turned it marginal. All right. um, 
going to protect. When you're saying compliance, it's compliance against the service service level service level. Right. So your goal on Diamond is around 0.6 milliseconds. If you drift over a millisecond and a half, right, you're going to go well over a millisecond or so. You'll go yellow. Over two milliseconds, you'll go red. Right? And if you're red, then you know, somebody come fix me. As it starts drifting up, of course, the array would say, well, gee, I've got these gold things in the array that aren't as important. I'm going to slow them down so I get more performance on diamond. Now, some of the golds may drift out of compliance at that point, but right, as long as my diamond stuff is making it, I don't care about gold. Right? So it'll do all that kind of stuff automatically. So I can use this to set up typical RDF where I can do RDFA uh, or synchronous. Um, in this case, I'm gonna, I don't want to demonstrate too many things because we're running out of time here. So I'm going to demonstrate SRDF Metro um, and just show you how easy, you know, we walked through on the slide how easy it was to do NDM. And I'll do a quick set of it in here. Uh, but let's show you how easy it is just to build up a Metro config. So I say I want to do Metro on this. And it says, well, gee, I see already that the only array you're attached to that could re be ready to do Metro because of code levels and all is this guy uh, 647. Right? There's nobody, nobody else in the list. Oh, there's two. But he's the, the target I'm going to pick. I'm going to let it automatically pick the RDF group I want to join. I'm going to automatically establish pairs for the new LUNs. Um, I'm going to tell it I want to use a witness. It'll pick the witness automatically because the RDF stuff's already established. Um, I'm going to use the same storage group name on the target that I have on the source. And I'm going to use the same diamond service level on the target that I have on the source. Right? So I'm ready to go do that. And here's my chance to review it. When I add this to the list, it will reach into the target array. It will create the new storage group. It will create LUNs that match my source LUNs. It will do the RDF relationship to them. It will copy all the data across. Then it will copy the personalities across, bring them up, and you'll be able to mask those to a host. But they will be identical from a worldwide name, serial number, all that point of view. So the host will just look at them as alternate paths to the same LUN. Right? So it's that easy to go ahead and create a Metro configuration. The real difference here in terms of this and migrations is this won't do the masking to the host because it doesn't, I mean, you do Metro, you may want to mask it to a new host. It's not necessarily back to the same one. It's not, a, not necessarily a migration. Um, this also doesn't tear anything down on the old one, right? <laughs> You're building a relationship, not destroying anything. So this is just going to create a new relationship. I can't book this in the demo version, so I'm just going to cancel out of it. Um, but it shows you how easy it is to build something like a metro relationship. Um, I also can take, if I want to take a storage group here um, and say I wanted to do NDM, since we're talking about NDM, I can say I want to migrate this guy. Uh, I didn't have a masking view. All right. I thought he was one that had a masking view. You can tell I spend all my days with my masking views, right, so that I know exactly what I'm supposed to migrate. Uh, migrate me. All right. I'm going to go back and find the first one. I thought I had three in my head that were working right, and now I'm not getting it. So <laughs> nothing like a live demo, right? All right. So I've got a storage group. I'm migrating it. I pick my target array. Um, in this case, there's only one array that's running the 78 code that's going to let me migrate to it. Um, so I can pick the, def the SRP I want to go to. In this case, the frame has two resource pools. So I can pick SRP1. Um, I'll let the port group go automatic. I say next. Um, I'm going to create the data migration. I'm going to allow compression um, on, the, on the group. And so now here's my review. It's going to go ahead and use this mask, create this masking view, right, um, with this port group to the host group, right? It's going to allow compression on the start target, and away we go, right? That's what it takes to do the create. And then, as we said, when this gets done, all I do is a commit, and I'm done. So it doesn't take a whole lot to move data between frames. Right, pick the group, pick the target frame, a couple of parameters, go. We're trying to make this really easy for customers to be able to pick up data and move it to new frames. The real goal is you know, when, you, when you buy a new array, we want to make it easy so you can take data from many arrays and put it on the new array. Right? As you buy a new frame, odds are what you really want on your latest and greatest and fastest array is your most important application, which probably isn't on your oldest array that you're going to get rid of. So we want to make it easy to take the best application and move it onto the new frame and then migrate the others from the older frame to the less old frames, right? And then pull the oldest one out of the environment all non-disruptively. We want to make it easy to do those asset roles. All right. So that's it on that. Um, let's go back home and look at a few other things. Um, we can go looking at, let's see, I'll, I'll, yeah, let's go look at VMware right now. So we have an ESX view. Um, we have some virtual centers. Uh, that have been registered, uh, we can go click on one of the servers. Um, 
and go look at the properties, right? Memory and cores and all those kinds of things. Um, we can drill into the masking views that are in use um, to allow that thing to see various LUNs and what arrays they're from, and you can drill into the details on those. We can drill into virtual machines and see lots of information about the VMs and the memory and the virtual CPUs and all that kind of stuff. Uh, we can go looking at performance um, and see how things work. Uh, you can look at, for example, this particular storage group, and here's the front end directors, and here's the front end ports, and here's the storage groups that it's a part of. And I mean, you can really quickly get from whatever your ESX server is all the way down to storage components behind it and understand your performance and know how everything's working. So again, we want to do this from the storage side. The same kind of thing happens on the VMware side with the VMware storage integration tools. Right? We have all the hooks into, into vCenter, and so vCenter can see the same kind of stuff from the array to the array side only from VMware. So now when the ESX or VMware admin calls up the storage guy and says, hey, I'm having problems with X, he can pull it up and say, hey, OK, let's look at the same X, and we can agree on where the problems are and what we're going to work on. It just makes it much easier for everybody to use the same terminology, get on the same page, see all the same pieces. All right? um, anything else in particular we want to look at? I guess I can look at some of the um, protection pieces. So I mean, all this information is at the storage group level. If you wanted to see like a specific LUN kinds of things, can you drill down to that level? Oh, sure. Um, let's see. I'll go take a look in the, in the compliance. I'll drop into a storage group. So I'll take this guy, and he opens up, and I can drill into individual okay. volumes. Uh, yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. Slowly loading the views, but yeah, right. You can drill down further um, and get to whatever you need to see to from the volume level, right, how much is allocated, and all, all kinds of pieces about those guys. And then you can do things like here, like you can also say, I want to expand this guy, right? I can just simply take 100, now it's 200 gigs, right? Add that to the job list, done, right? And so LUN level migrate management's easy to do. Add LUNs to the storage group, just at the storage group level, create more capacity, change service levels, whatever you need.